All right, today I want to start out by covering this dialog box lab. And again, I've asked you to just sit back and watch. In fairness to those people who did it on their own, I'm going to record this for later, but I'm not going to post the recording until after midnight tonight. So those of you that aren't done yet can still finish it without any penalties. I'm also going to kind of post the finished product until afterwards. That way it'll be up there in case you need to see it. But I got the impression that some of you struggle with this mightily, so I want to make sure that all the highlights of this uh, lab and this part of my notes have sunk in. When, we, when you first launched this basic text file programming uh, program that we wrote, it automatically uses the roster.txt file. It's hard-coded. It's a constant. There's no way around that. When I say open, it goes out and gets my roster text file. Think. I hope. Please. Unless it's going. But anyways, hard coded. I don't want that. I want to be able to let the user pick, first of all, where they open the file from. And then secondly, when they save it, I want to give them the option to either overwrite the existing file or save it in a different location with a save as type dialog box. So those are the different dialog boxes. There are five, there are more dialog boxes than we need for this lab. So I'm only going to do the two that we need. The first one, if I want them to open from a new location, I need to go down to the dialogs group. And there's all the dialog boxes that you can use. The only ones we're going to be using in this class explicitly are open and saved. It doesn't mean you can't experiment with the color and the font one that my notes also discuss briefly. I want an open file dialog, so I bring that beast in. It goes into the component tray. I want to give it a name. I use DLG as a prefix to remind me that it's a dialog box. It's an open dialog box. Done. Like every other object out there, it has a ton of properties that you can mess with. A few of them we're going to modify. Most of them we leave alone. One of the important ones is the file exists property. Check file exists. It's defaulted to true. Miguel, you're just watching, right? No following today. Not this one. File exists. That's set to true. So the user cannot try to open a file that doesn't exist. The dialog box will intercept it. So one of the first things we're going to do, we did in the lab, is remove the if statement that we had that check to see if the file exists because we really don't need that anymore. A couple of other properties we'll mess with, the file name property, the filter property, the initial directory. The file name contains the name of the file. Initially, it's set to some goofy name. We can wipe it out here. I ask you to do it at form load instead. Either way will work to initialize it to the empty string if that's what you want. Or we could initialize it to our constant and say, I want the default file name to be roster.txt. They can still change it. So that's a little different than you did in the lab. Each one of these standard dialog boxes, when you're ready to use it, you use the show dialog command. The show dialog <laughs> command will return one of two values, either an OK or a cancel. If they click the Save button, the Open button, or the OK button, or whatever it is, that returns a value of OK. If they click the other button, it returns a value of Cancel. What I'm really interested in is, did they click the OK button? So at that point, I'm ready to start using this. But let's first go into the code. And for button open, I want to remove this if the file exists. Now, some of you brought yourself some grief here because you didn't delete carefully. If you're deleting an if statement that comes with a curly bracket, here's its twin. Whenever you delete a curly bracket, delete the twin. As it turns out, not only do I don't want the if, but the entire else. I don't need that message because the user cannot pick a file using this open file dialog that doesn't exist. Open file dialog has its own validation built in. So I don't have to write my own. Once again, here's the beginning curly bracket. There's the end curly bracket. Got rid of that. 
I don't need to see if the file exists, so I get rid of that. Now in the lab it's suggested that you create a variable whose type or class is dialog result. Now I tried to talk to most of you, maybe individually, kind of as a group. We're beyond programming logic beginning where everything was a primitive type. Int, a double, a string, a boolean. Those are called the primitive types. They were initially built into the language. They've always been there. They're a foundation of all languages. They have those primitive types. In addition to those, Jess has told me that you can't hear me when I walk away from the mic, so I'm not going to talk too much over there. In addition to those, Visual Studio and most other languages have all kinds of pre-built classes. You've been using those all along. Kind of getting into the next unit or next half of the unit here. You've been using text boxes, radio buttons, buttons. Those are all classes pre-built by somebody for us so that we don't have to build them. We don't have to describe what a button looks like. We don't have to describe all its properties. We don't have to describe how it works. It's all built in. In addition to that built-in visual class, a button, a text box, there are code classes like Stream Reader. There's no visual component for the Stream Reader. But it's a class that's pre-built for us by Microsoft to allow us to read from a file. So there are primitive types, the ones you learned about early on. There are built-in classes. And there's one more that I haven't talked about I'm going to talk about very briefly here. And that's a new, oh, I take it back, I might have talked about it, but enumerations. Enumerations are predefined lists, constant lists. Remember color, dot red, color, dot blue. Color is an enumeration. It's a list of predefined values. Dialog result, even though it looks just like stream reader and colors, that lovely teal shade, is an enumeration. Because when I hit dot, all I get is lists of values that I can choose from. Okay. That's a type. Sorry. It's an enumeration. I use the word type a lot because it's just a little more generic. What type of object is this? Right? What type of object is this? Some are primitive types, some are classes, some are enumerations, and I might be forgetting something else, but those are the three primary ones. So that's an enumeration. My lab said use the variable result. That's just a variable name. You can call it whatever you want. I think in future units, I even recall it response. It's the user's response to my dialog box. Doesn't matter what you call it. I think Steve was calling it George just to help keep his main, but if he turns George in, he's going to be in trouble. The other two things, dialog result seems redundant to say result. Right. It, it is a little bit redundant. You're right. But that like, that's like saying this is my name string. What type is it? String. So we need that because this is its class. I can't control that, but I can name it whatever I want. Now the next thing I want to do is show that dialog box like it said in my notes. My dialog box is called DLG Open, and I want to show it. It's a dialog box, so it always shows as a dialog. What show dialog means is this is going to appear modally. That's another term that you need to learn. Modal, M-O-D-A-L. It is in the notes over here somewhere. There. Okay. Modal means when this dialog pops up, the program behind it freezes. If you say save in Microsoft Word, it comes up with, a, or save as, comes up with a box, says where do you want to put it? You cannot push that box aside, go back to Microsoft Word and keep typing while that box is open. You can't do it. Okay. On the other hand, if I type, or if I ask for the about screen here in help, There is one. There it is. This one is modeless, meaning I can leave up. Oh, that one's modal too. That's rude. I can't do anything until I close this. Most about screens are modeless, L-E-S-S, -S, meaning you can push them aside and keep working while the about screen's open. So these dialog boxes come in two flavors. 
the ones that we're working with, the open dialogue is always modal. You cannot do anything behind the scenes until you close this dialog box. That's what that means. Now, as my note said, this, this method, show dialog, returns a value that designates which button the user clicked. If it's going to return that, it's going to send it back to me. I need to save it someplace in my variable of the, of the appropriate type. So oh, come on. What you're going to be learning in this class as well is about methods and writing your own. Some methods just do something. And when they're done, they're done. Other methods, like show dialog, do something, like show the dialog, collect a bunch of information. When they're done, they send you information back. This one sends information back. Any method that sends information back, if you want to capture that, you have to put it in a variable or do something else with it. Put it in a formula, you can do that. But generally, you put it in a variable. If you don't, you don't get an error. You just don't get the value. It ignores it. <clears throat> Now that I've shown the dialog, when this, remember this is show dialog, so when this command executes, this command executes, that's no good, it's in the recording, let's point to it with the mouse. <clears throat> I just want to get up a little bit today. When this command executes, the rest of the program pauses. It doesn't do anything, it just sits there. And the dialog box takes control of your program until the user clicks cancel or open. And then the program goes on. The first thing I generally want to know is, did they click the OK button? If the result variable is the same as dialog result dot OK. Notice all these little symbols. Some of them mean things. These mean they're part of an acceptable enumerated list. Don't need to know what they mean. Just need to know that they're available. Is it equal to the OK button? Did the user click OK? If they did, then process all this stuff. And this is slightly different than the way I had you do it. I had you move this inside the if statement. You've, most of you have done that already, so now I can take the shortcut way. If they said OK, then go ahead and read the file that they picked. Done. If they don't click OK, what do I do? Nothing. Skip this. They changed their mind, obviously, because they clicked on cancel, so there's nothing to open. The dialog box goes away, and my program just sits there until they do something else with it. Questions about show dialog and the result variable that comes out? <clears throat> yeah? Sorry. Um, if you were putting that into a list box, how would you use that into a list box? I have no idea. In other words, figure it out. How would I put, put what into the list box? The result? Why would I want the result in a list box? This is an OK button or a cancel button. That's all it is. When I show dialog, result has either OK or cancel in it. Why do I want to put OK or cancel in a list box? I don't. I want the contents of my file. You want the contents of your file in a list box, but I don't want this in a list box. You all should know by now what those dialog boxes look like. Here's what they look like with an open and a cancel. Windows 8, slightly different, open and cancel sideways. But other than that, very similar. The other thing that's confusing is a lot of people expect that the file name that I selected in show dialog will be stored inside this result variable. That's not true. The result variable only has in it OK or cancel. That's it. Everything else about the file that the user selected is stored in the dialog box, that dialog control properties. So the file name gets put in here. Whatever the user picked, the path, the entire path and file name go inside there. That's where they go. So if I want to open that file so that I can read it, I've changed this because that's my constant to be whatever's in the dialog box open dot file name. 
How do you know these things? You read about it. There's gross documentation on the web that's written by Microsoft gurus that some people know how to decipher and I don't. If you want to use an open dialogue, maybe you Google it, maybe you look in a book, if you've got a favorite book. That's part of why I made you Google as the lab to find out how to connect to stuff because Google is going to be your friend as a programmer. It's the new documentation. Doesn't give you the answer. Steve's shaking his head over there, I think. If it doesn't give you the answers, you just got to get better at Googling. That's why I'm making you do it. The answers are there. It is a skill. Absolutely a skill that you will develop to find the right answer that you're looking for amongst all that clutter. But until you start practicing, it's going to be hard. That's why I'm throwing this stuff at you. Now what this says is, instead of opening roster.txt all the time, I'll open the file that the user said to open using the open dialog box. So let's give that a quick test. In the lab, I had you move the roster file to your desktop someplace. When I click on open, this is looking where? I don't know. Let's find out. Um, in the documents folder, that's interesting. On OneDrive, no less. Why is it going there? It's the last place you open. Maybe. Yeah. All of these open dialog boxes are kind of linked together. But I don't remember going there, honestly ever. <laughs> so that's a problem, right? Because this dialog box is going somewhere. We don't know where. So one of the things we need to tweak, and we will, is controlling where this dialog looks in the first place. The user can still change it. I could, doesn't matter where this is. I can still navigate around and go to my MSTC folder, go to my programming logic folder, go to, oh, I don't know, where should we look? Uh, here's a nice CS file, Volker Tools. <coughs> Wait a minute, that's not a text file. Oh, yes, it is. There's nothing in there but text. It may hide the CS extension that designates this text as probably a C-sharp file, but there's nothing in it but text. So my text reading, my file command, should be able to read that. And it did. As long as it's got text in it, it'll read it, regardless of the extension. Extension is just used by Windows to figure out which program to use to open a file. As IT professionals, you have to be smarter than Windows. Sometimes that's hard. Most of the time, that's not so, easy. That's not so bad. You have to know what's in that file. If I tried this on a Word document, I don't remember what I opened, but it was one of my notes. I think it's a little longer than that. It's not text. It did the best it could. That <coughs> looks awful small to me. I would thought I'd get a lot, whole, whole lot more gibberish. You can try to open other files. But unless they're text-only files, you're probably not going to be successful. So there's another not PowerPoint. That's not going to work because those have special formats. Well, uh, what if I went to my web programming class? <coughs> Shouldn't be so hard to find it. Okay. And I probably have some nice in-class examples here. Let's try this one. And here's an HTML file. Looking ahead, what's in there? Pure text. What's in the CSS file? Pure text. PHP file? Pure text. You can open. You have created, by the time we're done here with this lab, you have created your own notepad. Right? What more does notepad do than this besides change the font and add some wrapping magic? Who cares? Just want to see what's in that text file. Just wrote our own. Now, if you want to, you could use your vast C sharp skills to give it pieces and things, make it do things that notepad won't do. So any text file I can open up. However, normally I want to open 
text files, TXT files. Where's the list that lets me pick that? Most open dialog boxes have a file type list. You don't ask for one, you don't get one. So we got two things to fix here. First of all, we want to control where this dialog box looks first. And oh, by the way, the file name property is a string. It contains the entire path. If you want to, you can strip out just the file name. So that would be sample.text here using this <coughs> command. Let's come back to that. Please help me remember when I save that I want to come back to that. For right now, check file exists. We talked about it. should always be true. I'm skipping around here. Let's not do that yet. Initial directory, that's what I want. Initial directory, where do I want my dialog box to look by default? If I'm writing my own notepad and I store all of my HTML, CSS files in my web programming folder, maybe that's the first place I want to go. Then I have to figure out how to type that path. And then I have to type it in here using the DLG initial directory command. A property, excuse me. DLG open has that property. Where do I do that? I would do it at form load. So here's form load. In form load, I want to set the initial directory for my dialog box. But if I want it to go to my web programming folder, how do I figure out that path? If you're not really DOS indoctrinated, most of you no longer are. So that can be tricky. Here's the way I do it. I cheat. I want to go to, it was my MSTC, whoops, my MSTC folder. It was web programming, and it was in class. Let's say from there, that's where I want to start. I'm just picking stuff. You can go anywhere. How do I get this? If you click the little folder guy here, it turns that into the old DOS style path with backslashes and all the other junk in it. That's the one I want, so I just copy it to the clipboard and paste it in here. But remember, the initial directory is also a string. I paste it in there. Hmm? That's a little folder guy. <laughs> it's a technical term. The little folder guy there. Okay. Now, what's wrong with these slashes? There needs to be two of them because a backslash, remember our backslash R, backslash N? Backslash means the next character has special meaning. Uh, no, it doesn't. In this case, the backslash is just a divider between my folder names. So we can double them up. That's, if you put two backslashes, it said the next character has special meaning. No, it doesn't. It's really just a backslash. Or there's another alternative that I didn't know about somebody stumbled on last year. If you put an at sign in front of your string, it leaves it all alone. What? <laughs> it's got your money's worth out of the lecture today. Who taught you? You figured that out. I don't remember. I think it was a Swift programmer, not a Swift programmer, an iOS programmer, because that's how you build all your strings in iOS, and they did it accidentally in programming, it? and it worked. Does so, that work for any string though? That's why you did the modulus sign. Yes. Pardon me? That's why I did the modulus sign. That's why you did the modulus sign? Oh, for the math program? Or not. You just act or that's the percent sign. If the back is divided, it's gonna be Yeah, but that that we did that as a pseudocode, we didn't have any better options. No, not okay. the actual signal in here. Yes, and you do the same thing. That's right. You can put the at side, and it'll, instead of trying to do something, it'll just leave it alone. And this is processing this one character at a time now. That's cool. Steve? One more time with clarity. How did you get that path name? Okay. I went to my Windows Explorer. Okay. I navigated <laughs> to wherever the heck I wanted to go. Okay. Then, the, then I hit this little folder guy here. On the left-hand side of the nav bar, right there, that guy. Right. Just clicked it, and it converted it for me. Yeah. You can also right click it. Okay. And then copy link address. There it goes again. As soon as I left it, put it back. Right click, copy address. Good. 
Okay. On the actual file itself. Now that's on the clipboard. I can paste it. Nice little trick, right? Okay, so now I've said when you run this program, initially start invokers in class folder for web programming. That's really a bad example because that's where it was just a minute ago, right? And as Rachel said, that's where you were just a while. So let's go. I'm going to pick someplace out in the middle of nowhere where I haven't been yet. So let's go back to MSTC and let's go to relational database. That sounds fun. Okay, and then we'll go to the in class folder. And there's an SQ, so there we'll use this one instead. So I'll use Tyler's technique, right click, copy the address, paste that in here. Relational database in class. What's with the squiggle? It's pink, spelling error, so what? So now, I've never been there before with this program. I should be able to start, and my program will start in that folder by default. And I can also click on it to see that I'm in the, make that a little bigger if I wanted to. Right. Yep, it's in the right folder. Here's an SQL file. Well, I'm smarter than Windows, I know that's text. This is what you're going to learn how to do in R RDD. Ew! It's like a lot of typing, eh, a lot of copying and pasting, but SQL files, pure text, because it's so transportable. Steve? So this wonderful command went into the method for um, text file form load. Yes. I was trying to put it into button open click. If you did it in button open click, it would change the initial directory back to this folder every single time you said button open. It would go back to, I went to RDD in class. Okay. I don't want it to do that. Right? So if the user says, no, I don't want RDD, I want web programming. When they go in there and they dig around, the next time they hit button open, it's going to go back to web programming. I want it to remember. All right, so the next step in the instruction, what mm -hmm. if you inform load, clear the dialog box by property? Why should this be done in form load and not in button open? For the same reason. Right. The, the lab says set the file name to the empty string, right? What does that do? It takes the garbage out. Let me take it out again real quick so you can see where I'm fixing this, or what I'm fixing. Yes. So what's the difference? There's one. But if, if, but if it's in form load and I'm the programmer, first place I go looking for why does stuff happen is in my code. If you're doing it at design time, it's a little trickier to find, but that's always my second thought. So it's really not that much of a big deal. Unless you've got 800 things in form load, then it might take a millionth of a second instead of a billionth of a second. You might be able to tell. Um, even if it's got something in the properties for the name and the, um, the clearing out for this, the string, like for the file name, is on form load by the time you open Form load it, overrides the design. Yeah, so the form load, even if there's something on the design or the actual name, it still clears it out anyways. Yes. If you do something in design and you do something in form load, the form load overrides the design because it happens when the program's running. So I don't usually do both. If I do, form load overrides the other one, so the other one's useless. So the answer is it's more useful to do it that way? No, not yet. It just depends what you want to do. Now, here, this thing. Why? Where did that name come from? It came from the dialog box, right? Because that's what Bill Gates decided it should be when we start. <coughs> that's a pretty goofy name. I still haven't answered the question. I'm not there yet. Give me a second. Okay. So I don't like that. I could erase it here. I decided to do it at form load. Please. Okay. So now if I take that out. Now it's clear, okay? But I still haven't answered this question. 
I'm not sure I've done it just yet. So now I can, I'm in the, my favorite folder. I don't have any file name distracting me. I can pick whatever I want. Now, let's say I pick import employee SQL again. And now I change some stuff here. What? Well, I can't type. <clears throat> Why can't I type in my text box? Wow, can I delete stuff from my text box? Oh yeah, it's full, maybe. <laughs> That's my guess, it's full. That's a big file that I just sucked in there. The text box may be full. All right, because it's letting me delete, I still can't type. It has a full I, I don't have an answer for this one, because it's letting me delete backspace, but I can't type. Can you paste? It look like it. So something's wrong there. I'll have to think about it. But now I've made some changes, right? What do I want to do? Save it. Well, I don't have a save dialog. So I'm not going to use that file anymore. Now I need a save dialog. You can't use the same dialog box. So I need a second one. But the save and the open dialog boxes work very, very similar. So now I have one of these. DLG save. It also has a file name that I can put stuff in or and I, I think I can even read it after the user saves I can read it and find out what name did they use. It has a filter we haven't talked about those yet I will. It has an initial directory. And it also has a file check file exists but notice this one's false. Why is it false by default? It allows me to create one. If I make that true, it will not allow me to create a new file. I cannot do a save as. Can't create a new file if I set that to true because the file has to exist. It basically is saying all you can do is save or save as over an existing file, but you're not allowed using save to create a new file. And I want to be able to do that most times. So that's going to be false. Now, when I hit button save, what do I want to do? The same stuff, but instead of putting it here, I want to put it where the user wants me to put it. So once again, I'm going to create another dialog result variable. Can I use the same name? Sure, two different methods. They don't even know about each other. And then show the dialog and save the result, just like I did before. <coughs> and see if they click the OK button. If they did, do all this stuff, otherwise skip it. Okay, so off we go. Let's go open a file. Let's pick one that's a little friendlier. Now I can type. Wow. I don't know why the SQL file wouldn't let me type. It doesn't make any sense. So now I've changed this. No one's save it. Notice where it goes by default. Right back to where I dragged it in. How did that happen? Magic. No, that's part of the dialogue system. All of the dialogue boxes, especially the ones that deal with files like this one does, they all communicate to each other. Somehow Windows keeps track of it. Hey, the last time you had a dialogue box open, this is where you were. So I'm guessing maybe you want to go back there again. I do. 
But the thing it doesn't have is a file name. I would like it to have the same file name that I had when I opened this, right? Because if this was called roster when I started, wouldn't I want to put it in the same place? So what I would do is before I show the save dialog, before you show the dialog, you set the DLG save dialog file name equal to the DLG open file name. So now they should both have the same file name. Whatever file I opened, they'll both have the save dialog will have the same name, which basically says save on top of it. Now this save dialog is a save as, right? Gives me a chance to change it. What if I just want to save over the top? Then I better have two buttons, one save, one to save as. Save asks no questions, just puts it right back in the same file. It's two buttons instead of one. Where is it going? It went back to my RDD because that's my initial directory. Every time I launch the program, it takes me back to my favorite directory. Save better have the same file name now. Oh, sort of. It does have the same file name. It's just gone and put the entire path in the front. Now, a couple of you looked at that and said, that's gross. I want to fix it. And I said, you don't have to. So you said, oh, good. Off you went. Isaac in the other class, however, said, no, it's ugly. I don't want that. I only want this to show up. Because I'm already in the same folder. Why do I need all this nonsense? You don't. So what he did, so he went back to my notes and went to that ugly piece of code here that said, give me just the file name. Now let's analyze that, and then I'll use it. Remember that string journal that you're keeping? You might want to get your pencils up. Because here are two, with a third one implied, two built-in string functions. The first one is last index of. It has a cousin called index of. What's an index? <coughs> hmm? A list. a list. It is a number in a list. Remember our combo box? And I said the first one is number one, zero, right? Not one, zero. Next one's one and two. And three. The number is the index. A string, because this is my open file name is a string, right? I'm sorry, this open file name, that's a string. Each character in that string has an index. The first character in your string, so if my string was roster.txt, the first character R is character 0, second one is character 1, then character 2, and 3, and so on and so forth. What the index of function and its cousin last index of do is find the index of this character. Actually, that string, I should say. Normally, when I do index of, it's for a single character. This is a single character, right? Double backslash, a single character. What index of does is said, start at the beginning, find me a backslash, er, right there. What's the index of that one? What's the index of that backslash? Mm -mm. I'm talking too fast. What's the index of that backslash? If this is, if I said start here, that's zero, right? One, two. <clears throat> that backslash is an index two. If you were using just index of, and normally you do, if you use index of backslash, it starts at the beginning and finds the first occurrence of the backslash, and it returns to you its index, its number. That's all it gives you, the number. <clears throat> last index of says start at the end and work backwards and give me the last backslash. There it is. What's the index of that? I'm not going to count, but it's probably around 12 or 13, right? Whatever that number is. Steve's counting. What is it? 12. 12. Ooh, lucky guess. 
I'll take your word for it. Okay. So this command right here says, give me the last index of the backslash in the file name, 12. And it does it faster than Steve because he had to go, zing, 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 zing. the computer just got 12. What am I going to do with that 12? That tells me where this is. I now know, my program now knows where that is. 12. Then what do I do? Add 1. What did I just find? The beginning of my file name, which is what I want. I had to come up with some scheme in my convoluted brain to say, how do I get to that? I need to get to that S. Well, I can't just look for an S because there could be all kinds of them in here. And I don't know that the name of the file is even S. It could be Roster. It could be Steve. It could be George. I don't know what the name is. <clears throat> but the file name comes after the last backslash. So I developed a little algorithm in my head that says, find the last backslash and move one position to the right by adding one. Now, what do I have? 13. This whole thing right here turns into 13. Any questions about index of and last index of? their cousins. One starts at the beginning, the other starts at the end. That's all. It's the only difference. They return a single number. What if it's not there? Wait, wait. Why if it's not there? Negative 1. Because zero is not is a valid number, right? We want a clue saying it's not there. Negative one. That sound familiar? We've done that, right? We used it when we were validating our combo box stuff. Give Microsoft a lot of credit. Many of their functions and methods are very consistent. If I'm looking for something and I don't find it, they all return to minus one. Now, in this case, that doesn't matter. Your question? What am I doing with the 13? Well, look, it's in parentheses, right? Yeah. Those parentheses are just down in the next line. They're really attached to substring, which is the next function. That's why I ask if there's any questions about last index of and index of, because I'm about done with those. Okay, so here's the next string function called substring. Substring comes in two flavors. Remember, we've seen a lot of methods that come, like the message box show that comes in 26 different flavors. Flavors, versions. Substring comes in two versions. What substring gives you is you give it a big string, it gives you a substring out. I want to pull something out of this string. That's what it does. And it has two versions. And let me scroll and make some room here. Here's the first version. Let me make a string here just temporarily. Probably going to get a syntax there. Hang on. Here's my string test. Test is going to be equal to my DLG open dot initial directory. That's a string, right? I did. It's right there. That's a string. I want a substring of that. Notice two flavors. One, two. The first flavor, you give it one number. And you can even read what it says here. It's almost English. This retrieves a substring from this instance, this instant, this string. The substring starts at the character position that you designate here. And it gives you everything to the end of the string. So if I said substring 13, this test string will go to character number 13, wherever that is. Let's pretend it's here because I don't want to count. Okay. And give me everything after it. I think this is a great place for a debug watch. We stopped. What's in test? Everything after the E in student, including the E in student. 
So this command says, give me a piece of that string starting at character number 13. Remember, they're numbered starting at zero. So this is really the 14th character. And give me from here to the end of the string. That's how it works. That's just the rules. Could you, could you put the, the last thing that's on? The yeah. Basically right? So let's, okay, he wants to see that. So let's do this here. The last substring starting at the DLG open initial directory last index of backslash. That's what I did before, right? Notice this, I have to repeat the string. Don't you do plus one to it? And we did plus one, thanks for the reminder. And otherwise you get the backslash. Otherwise you get the backslash. All right. So this gets processed first. That gives me the index of that guy right there. <clears throat> that slash right there. Then I send that number to substring, and substring starts here and gives me everything to the end. <coughs> so what do you expect to see in here in class? Magic. But what if I want something out of the middle? Then there's a second version of substring. Too many good information today. Lots of good information. Let's pretend that I want MSTC. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. I want to start at 26. But I don't want all of this. I only want four characters. How do I know that? I'm just making this up. Here's the second version of substring. You provided a second number. The second number, this is the part that confuses people, and, and me too. The second number doesn't tell me where to end. You would think so, right? Start at 26, go to 35. No. The second number tells me how many characters do I want? Four. Characters from where it starts. 26 is where it starts. Second number is how many characters do you want? Yeah. But I don't get to write these things. This is built into the language. What do we expect? MSTC. It kind of makes sense because that's how we did the, the like string editing before. Mm -hmm. It's the same way. Kind of. But how did I know where the MSTC ended? Oh, that's a whole other algorithm. We'll leave that for another day. Right. The point here is the substring function exists. It's a string function. It's important. Very valuable. Remember when we were looking at my roster file and I said, I got to yank this out of the middle? How do you do that? Substring. Index of. Last index of. I use those in combination with each other and come up with an algorithm in my own head to say, here's the thought process I got to go through to teach this program to suck <coughs> that number out of there. Go ahead. Uh, so, for example, you have that 26, and then you have the comma, right? And then you put where you want it to end? No. Like for the number? No. Before, That's not what four means. I mean, the how many characters from what? Thank you. How many characters? Is it possible for you to set it up so that it will detect the next um, Absolutely. backslash after? We're talking about computer programming here. Except for mind reading, it can do anything. <laughs> so yes. How? Work on it. Okay. <clears throat> because then you wouldn't have to like figure out how many letters you, or how many characters from the 26 you needed to end. I'm going to show you something. Hang in there. Where is it? Come on. Why can't I see my folder I'm working on? Oh. I want to know this section number right there. I need that. I, for my roster, I need that section number. How do I get that out of there? First of all, I work my way down, read, 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 until there's a parenthesis in the line. Because there's no parentheses on these lines up here. How did I know that? I made this file. I looked inside and said, hmm, how am I going to find this beast? Oh, look, there's the first parenthesis. Is it always on line number nine? No. Put blank lines above now. It doesn't find it. 
So what I do in my program is said, read, 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 read one line in. Is there a parenthesis in that line? No. Just next line, next line, next. There's a parenthesis in there. Yes. How do I ask if there's a parenthesis in there? Dot contains. Write that down. It's not a substance. It's another string function. Contains. Does this string contain this character or these characters? Contains. Does it contain a parenthesis? Yes, it does. Oh, cool. This is the line. Now what do I do? I do an index of command. What's the index of the parenthesis? Um, 23. I save that in a variable. Start. Then what? I find the index of a right parenthesis. What's that? 28. I could do that. I don't have to. All section numbers are five characters long. I take the start plus one. Give me five characters. Substring. Sucks it right out of there. I'm done. You just got to come up with these strategies. And you're not going to until you have to. I didn't come up with this, you know. There's no fixed way to, to take that out of there. In a way, there, there's a standard kind of algorithm. What are you looking for at the beginning? Parenthesis. Save that. What are you looking for at the end? Close parenthesis. Find it. What's the index of a close parenthesis? 28. Subtract the end. Sorry, from the beginning from the end. 28 minus 3. Five characters is how many I need. Suck those up. That way, if they're this far apart, it even figures out how long the string is. There's all kind. Got sidetracked. Questions? Karen looked like you're ready to spit one out of her. Oh. Maybe she's just getting ready to throw up at this lecture. Yeah, we got sidetracked, but I wanted to point out one, two, three, you should have four functions, methods, string methods in your journal now. Do a little more research on them. Give yourself some examples in your journal so that when you go to the journal and it says, here's what it looks like, you don't go, huh? Well, okay, that's great. How do I use that? Put some <coughs> examples in it. Write English descriptions of what they do. Index of, last index of, substring, and contains. Very valuable. But that's not all. There's more later. Um, I know I'm running along here, but I want to do my filter stuff here. I'll leave this because I promised to post it after midnight, and you can see my example of substring there in case you want to steal it to put it in a journal or something like that. Now, when I launch this, initially, my dialog box shows me all kinds of files. And if I'm looking in a project folder of C Sharp, I'm going to see project files and all this other junk cluttering up my screen. I want to be able to filter those out so that I only see my favorite kind of files, whatever they might be. The filter command only needs to be done once. Yes, you can do it at design time, but it's really kind of ugly there. I like to do it in code. DLG open dot filter. The filter is a string. For each filter, there are two parts. The first thing is an English description of the types of files that we're looking at. So I might say that these are Volker text files. I'm just making that up. I'm going to change it to be something a little more professional Microsoft standard in just a second. But I want you to see that this is whatever you want it to be. And then a vertical bar. This is in my notes, but the vertical bars in my notes have spaces around them so they're easy to see. <coughs> Do not put the spaces in. It causes trouble. After the vertical bar, you put in a description of what kind of files you want to see. They typically include a wildcard character, star. Star means anything then a dot and a txt. So what that says is give me a list of all the files that have anything in the front but the extension of txt. It's old DOS stuff that's still hanging around. It's also used in queries in Access, right? And you did queries with stars and you did like star this that. They show up a lot. So what this says is give me a filter on my open dialog box that will show the user this word but behind the scenes, apply this. 
I'm also going to change my initial directory. Somewhere in here, my notes, probably under initial directory, it says if you want your initial directory to be your executable path, the same place as your executable, use this. Now, many of you did the research in Google and you found something that was about this long, right? For how to find the directory of the desktop of any user, all right? That's useful too. No, I'm not going to show you how. Got to go dig that out of Google. Remember my tips for searching. Always start with the language name, C Sharp. JavaScript, PHP, what is it you're looking for? C Sharp, then what do you want? And you're probably going to get a lot closer if you start with the language. Last thing you want is instructions on how to do it in VB. Type that in, doesn't work, and you cuss and swear, and you blame me because Google lied to you. Didn't. You didn't look in the right place. Start with the language. So I need the application startup path. So I'm going to put that in here. So now when I run my program, first place it's going to look is in my bin folder, debug folder, whatever that folder is. And that's good because I want to see text files. Go. Notice now there's a new thing here. Whoa. Whoa. <coughs> Oh my God. Where'd that come from? I made you type it, didn't I? And it's there already. I didn't know that. I've never tried this without, I always type those in there myself, and now I didn't type it in, it tacked it on there for me. Honest engine, I didn't know till just now that it does that. You can drop this down, there's no other choices. I didn't expect that there, honestly didn't. But notice all the other files that were in here, all the executables and all that other junk, they're hidden. They're gone. They're not gone, they're just not showing. We're filtering, we're only showing the files that are requested in this filter. This filter box wasn't there until I defined a filter. It wasn't even there. All right, now I'm gonna try something, because I'm learning stuff. You can tack on as many of these favorites as you want. Every one of them is a pair. Describe it. What's the, what's the filter? Describe it. What's the filter? We can put as many of them in here as we want. Another very common one is all files, and I'm not going to put the star dot star after it, see what happens, but its filter is star dot star. That says, I don't care what's at the beginning, I don't care what the extension is, give it to me. Everything. This one you usually always add so that the user can't find what they're looking for. They look at all files and try to figure it out. Maybe it's got a goofy extension. Who knows? Somebody in the other class said, can I put stuff on the left-hand side here? I only want files that include the word programming. Sure. It's not common, but you can do it. Let's run this again because I'm curious. Oh! Son of a gun, time to update my notes again. Catherine gave me this funny look today because they want notes for programming logic beginning. And she said, aren't they just in the bookstore? I said, no, they change like every half hour. <laughs> These notes, your notes are already out of date. And it's been a week and a half and I just discovered something I didn't know until today. You don't need to type those in. If you type in your own, you can, then they go. It doesn't double them. That's interesting. And I didn't spell files very well. I'll fix that. But here's all files. Notice all those hidden files come back again. This one ends in exe. This one ends in config, pdb, exe. If I go back to txt, it only shows me the files that end in txt. So why does she copy it? Because there's a programming logic beginning class and they want my notes and there's a bunch. Huh? Yeah. You want to take it again? You can sign you up. Well, I thought you only offered it to Generally, yeah. But we're so overwhelmed that class is actually full. All files. Okay. Now let's just do a couple more. What if I want, let's say, web files? Web files. It gets its own vertical bar, it gets its own description. That might be an HTM file. It might be an HTML file. 
it might be a CSS file. If you wish, you can have multiple patterns. That's what these are, patterns, or I think I called them, what did I call them? Description and what else? Designations. Filter description is first, then the filter designation. This is what I call this. You can have multiples. So here I'm saying, if they pick web files, show me HTML, HT, HTM, HTML, and CSS files. Any of those. But hide everybody else. Now Volker's curious what happens when I have three of those at the end. Does it give me all of them? Notice how many files there are. It looks like there's no files in that folder. That's well, because I filtered all that other stuff out. Let's go see if I can find some CSS files here real quick. And we'll call it a day, for, or not a day, but an hour. Um, web programming should be good. How about in class? about unit? Website sounds good. Here's some CSS files. It shows them to me. Here's an HTML file. I double clicked it, now it's opening it. It's going all the way to OneDrive to get it, so it's going to take a half an hour. Cancel it. Okay, so you can put as many of these filters in here as you want, and you see some programs, you get a list like this, right? It's huge. And you get to pick Microsoft Word does it. How do you want to save this? CSS file, PDF file, old Word file, new Word file, Word template, templates with macros, documents with macros. All these different categories that you get to choose from. You get to do the same thing for your programs if you wish. can do multi-select for input. I want to bring in one, two, three, four files. Then what happens? I don't know. I've never done it. How do you get four files in one file name? You probably get an array, a collection of file names, and you got to walk through them. Never done it. There's our save dialog, and the rest of it we don't need, so we're not going to talk about it. Steve has one last question. Actually... What is my filter for save? That one's empty. What's my filter for save? There isn't one. Uh-oh. So the lab said, make the filter for the save box the same as the filter for the <coughs> file name box. So many of you did this. There, do the same. It's acceptable, but that's the hard way. Steve's happy, but that's the hard way. This is a string. Copy it into that string. It's all the way underneath here. Holy cow. You got the same list. So instead of retyping it, just copy it in. This is getting annoying. That way I only have to change it once. If I mistype something, I only have to change it once. So again, I will save this. I will post it to OneDrive tomorrow morning along with this recording. Take 10, come back, and I'll introduce you to classes, and I'll give you some lap time.